This video is going to be about two of my favorite things, books and food. I am alone this week so I'm going to be cooking for myself which is one of my favorite things to do. I love cooking for other people but there's something so so satisfying about cooking for yourself, making a meal and being like, oh my god I did that. So looking forward to that. I will also be documenting the books that I am reading. So these are the books that I am hoping to read this week. The first one is Behind You is the Sea. This is about a Palestinian American community in Baltimore. From my understanding it is a series of short stories from the perspectives of different members of the community. The blurb says an exciting day debut novel that gives voice to the diverse residents of a Palestinian American community in Baltimore whose lives intersect across divides of class, generation, and religion. The next book I'm reading is Memorial by Brian Washington. Memorial is about a gay couple, Benson and Mike. They live in Houston. Mike is a Japanese American chef and Benson is a black daycare teacher. The relationship is somewhat rocky and things get complicated when Mike finds out that his estranged dad is dying in Osaka and his mother arrives in Texas to visit him and then Mike just hops on a plane to Japan while his mom is in Texas so his mom has to stay with Benson and it's really really awkward because they've never met each other before. I'm very curious about the dynamics in this book. It sounds very very messy. I am also trying to read my first Toni Morrison book ever. This is Sula. It's about two black girls, Nell and Sula. Growing up in the small town of Medallion, in Ohio, they become best friends but as they grow up something something happens. I'll read you some of the blur because it is very intriguing. Two girls who grow up to become women. Two friends who become something worse than enemies. Toni Morrison tells the story of Nell Wright and Sula Peace who meet as children in the small town of Medallion, Ohio. Their devotion is fierce enough to withstand bullies and the burden of a dreadful secret. But their friendship ends in an unforgivable betrayal. Or does it end? I am very very excited for this one because I love novels about female friendship. I really love literature that can capture how complicated and intense female friendships can be especially when you are friends from childhood. So I am really excited for this and also excited to experience my first Toni Morrison. Got my tomato egg, my barley tea, and of course, no meal is complete without <laughs> some chili oil. Hmm. This is always so good. I could eat this every day. This is how I know he's an Asian cat. Right, Kiwi? So I bought this strawberry milk tea drink from Yami, which is an app where you can buy like Asian food and groceries and snacks. Come to find out that there is no tea in this drink, it's just strawberry milk, which may explain why in the reviews people were like, oh, children really love this drink. Um, but <laughs> let's try it out. I think it'll probably be really good. Wow, that is really sweet. Um, not bad though. But I probably wouldn't buy it again. This is the drink if you're curious. This is a tangerine that my mom got from my grandparents' backyard. So it's organic, as she likes to say. <laughs> so I am about uh, two-thirds through Memorial. Um, like I said, it's a pretty fast read. I am really struck by how Brian Washington writes the um, perspective of Mike who's a Japanese American chef. I think the way he writes um, Mike's internal conflicts about being you know, Japanese but growing up in America um, really really well. It's really, like, very resonant. I'm sure a lot of Asian Americans would as well. The way he writes the relationship with the dad which is a very messy and complex relationship, very fraught, um, is really interesting too. And I think the thing about every relationship in the book, even when there's 
a lot of tension there's also still a lot of love you know i i also like that the book doesn't really delve into like the morality of any of the ways that these characters are acting but you know it provides reasons for the way that they're acting that way and for their motivations but it isn't really interested in judging the characters for what they're doing which i feel is very realistic like people do shitty things and you know people aren't perfect The yuzu and black pepper is the best flavor. Um, I also really like the hot garlic though. That one's really good, but it's super savory. Good morning. I'm gonna make myself some milk tea. It's just a lot cheaper to make it at home. I'm only on page 13 so this is not really a spoiler but in the first POV that we get, the dad dies and there's this line The day he dies, Baba looks skinny and surprised When he sucks in the last breath, his mouth opens in an O like America shocked him at last and freezes there It's like he finally understood he was never meant to win here There's this subversion of the American dream Like I said, I'm only on page 13 but so far I am really enjoying the writing It is both quietly devastating but there's also a lot of hope and love in here um, so I'm excited to keep reading It is dinner time and I am so hungry um, but I have some pork that I need to use up and I think I'm going to try making this ginger pork from this recipe that I found online. I'm using the recipe from Just One Cookbook so yeah, hope this turns out good. <laughs> really good. I feel like ginger and soy sauce is always such a winning combination. Mmm! I took some shortcuts with the recipe because in the recipe it uses onion and I didn't even I didn't even want to bother with that. <laughs> but even with just the ginger and the soy sauce um, it's really really good. Definitely gonna call this a success. Um, and I will probably use this recipe again in the future.
just finished reading To Mary and to Meadow by Martha Waters. This is a Regency romance and it is the third in her series and I've read the other two as well and I enjoyed them. So this story is a marriage of convenience. Emily and Julian get married because Julian wants to bolster the reputation of his theater which is known as like a very raunchy place where guys take their mistresses and not their wives and Emily is a woman who is known to be able to weather scandal. She is able to still have her reputation intact even though her family makes her like hang around this old guy because he has a lot on her family or whatever. It's like it's a whole weird thing but it is a marriage of convenience but they are friends and so the story is about them basically realizing that oh they actually love each other as you may expect this one's a lot more drama free than her other books and is kind of self-aware too at certain points that like there are definitely tropes in regency room so it was kind of refreshing to read a story where the characters were just communicating and it's kind of nice <laughs> Last night I watched Lust Caution with my friend Rachel and I had just finished the short story that the movie is based on. If you haven't watched Lust Caution, it's about this young girl who starts off as a student. She's a drama student. She gets wrapped up in this like amateur assassination plot to take out one of the main Chinese collaborators with the Japanese. So her whole thing is that she's gonna try to seduce him in order to kill him. And it's the same exact narrative in the short story. I was really surprised by how the film stays true to the text. The story takes only like maybe an hour at most to read, but it results in a two and a half hour movie. And it doesn't really feel like the movie actually adds a lot to what's in the text. Ang Lee, the director of the film, wrote an afterword for this short story. He said, Making our film, we didn't really adapt Zhang's work. We simply kept returning to her theater of cruelty and love until we had enough to make a movie of it. And that really rings true after watching the movie and reading the story. I felt like everything that was in the movie could be inferred from the story. Like the characters were very in character. Any kind of backstory or extra scenes that they added that weren't in the story is like the same world and the same characters. <laughs> Also heated up some leftover pork and cabbage for a side. Um, but this looks really yummy. I think Kiwi agrees. I'll try one of the mushrooms first. Hmm. I think I slice them too thin. Because if I had sliced them a bit thicker, they would have more of like a meaty texture. But it's still yummy. Okay, Kiwi. Some final thoughts on my reads of the week, um, but first check out my shirt. I love it so much. Anyway, out of these three books, two of them made me sob like a baby. So that gives you an idea of what my mental state was this week. I would probably not recommend reading these three books in a row, but individually they were all great, great novels. I really enjoyed each of them individually. Again, reading them in a row was probably not the best idea. <laughs> 
So behind you is the sea. I really loved each of these stories. It's more of vignettes than like one continuous novel, but I really like that it gave you so many different POVs within the same community. So it kind of gave you a portrait of this community rather than one singular cohesive narrative. Because there's so much diversity in the cast of characters, there are characters of different ages and generations, socioeconomic statuses. This really subverts stereotypes of Palestinian American and Arab American communities. My favorite story in here was Worry Beads. This was about a divorcee and her relationship with her estranged family and her dad who is now in a retirement home. He has dementia and can barely remember her. There are some moments of lucidity and through the moments of his dementia, she's actually able to piece together kind of the puzzle of how the family estrangement happened. There's also a little bit of a love story which felt very, very well earned for this character and I really, really loved it. The story in particular made me, this made me sob, like it was, <laughs> it was so, so good, really, really touching. I found it really remarkable how much I could feel attached to the characters even through these small vignettes of their lives. Not getting a full novel about each character, but you feel really attached to them because there's so much immediacy. You feel like there's so much of them on the page in the little snippet that you do get. And I think that really speaks to the author's skill as a writer. My second favorite story in here is Cleaning Lentils. It's about a girl who is recovering from an eating disorder and she goes to live with her grandparents. And I really love the depiction of their relationship with her grandparents and how nurturing and kind it is. It reminded me a bit of my grandparents. It was really, really sweet. And she has a difficult relationship with her parents. So it's incredibly healing for her to be in this home with her grandparents and experience this kind of really nurturing kind of love. But yeah, so those were my two favorite stories, but I really enjoyed every single story in here. Memorial, oh my god, this book was... <laughs> This book put me through the ringer. It is so, so brutal. So as I've mentioned, it is about a queer relationship that is in crisis. What touched me the most about this book is actually the relationship between one of the main characters and his dad. They are kind of estranged, but he goes back to Osaka to see his dad because his dad is dying of cancer and his dad like didn't really tell anyone and doesn't really want his help but then you see their relationship kind of not completely mend but it changes and evolves and it is just so so beautiful but also really really sad i don't think there's ever a moment of like pure happiness in this book that isn't touched by sadness in some way which sounds really depressing and this book was really depressing like i read this one and i cried a lot and then the next day i finished this one and i was just like sobbing sobbing don't read these two at the same time don't do it <laughs> read them individually but not at the same time i really loved how brian washington writes about food i thought that was really well done food as a way to care for someone as a way to show love and i really liked the relationships between each of the characters and how nuanced they were i will say that though the story revolves around this queer relationship i wasn't really convinced that they should stay together the whole time i was kind of like why are they together they seem really really unhappy together but at the same time it kind of reflects every other relationship and how each relationship is very multi-dimensional so yeah i do have mixed feelings about the core relationship in the book but i absolutely love the parts between mike and his dad it just just wrecked me Last but not least, we have Sula by Toni Morrison. This was my first Toni Morrison read and it will definitely not be my last. I could tell from the very first sentence, the very first page, that Toni Morrison was superbly talented. Like, I've always known that Toni Morrison is a revered writer, but seriously, it took me like one paragraph to be like, oh, this is why. And that feeling never left the entire time I was reading the book. What is really shocking to me is how this book is just shy of 200 pages. It is 174 pages, but it says so much about each of the characters, about the community that they grow up in, and about the state of the world during this time in such few words, honestly. It is really, really remarkable. I started Sula thinking that it was a book primarily about friendship, and it is very much so, but it is also existentially about womanhood and girlhood itself. And womanhood and girlhood and relationships between women in the context of patriarchy, in the context of racism and oppression. 
and how these systems make it very very difficult to you know to be a girl's girl i guess if you want to put it in, <laughs> if you want to oversimplify it sula the title character is this really fearless woman who lives by her own rules but the price that she pays for that freedom is that she is very ultimately alone and for me it made me think about what is the price of living on your own terms and if that's even really possible it's really hard to articulate what i'm trying to say but i think toni morrison did it herself best in the uh, foreword i'll just read this part to you Outlaw women are fascinating, not always for their behavior, but because historically women are seen as naturally disruptive and their status is an illegal one from birth if it is not under the rule of men. In much literature, a woman's escape from male rule led to regret, misery, if not complete disaster. In Sula, I wanted to explore the consequences of what that escape might be on not only a conventional black society, but on female friendship. In 1969 in Queens, snatching liberty seemed compelling. Some of us thrived, some of us died. All of us had a taste. There you have it. I have nothing to add. No notes. Just, just read this. If you've read any of these books, I would love to know your thoughts. I will also be linking the recipes that I used in the description box. Thanks so much for watching. Bye.